Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Monday Bible podcast. I'm thrilled to have you all here as we dive into a fascinating discussion about the intersection of artificial intelligence and our daily lives. Today, we have a very special guest with us, uh, Piek Vossen. Piek is a professor of computational lexicology at Vrije Universiteit Amsterdam and an executive board member of the Hybrid Intelligence Center and the Global World Net Organization. He is an esteemed researcher in the field of AI and natural language processing. Hello, Pik. It's great you could join me. Hello. Nice to be here. You delivered an insightful speech at the Eurix Foundation annual meeting on ChatGPT, discussing its capabilities, limitations, uh, and ethical considerations. Uh, I would like to delve deeper into these topics uh, today. So maybe you could start by elaborating what ChatGPT is and clarifying some common misconceptions about its capabilities. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you for the opportunity. Let's see. Then feel free to interrupt and uh, and ask questions. So I will go to these slides. Basically, first uh, 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 trying to describe uh, in, in a little bit more detail what these models are and how they are being constructed and what they can do and what they cannot do. And then maybe go a little bit more into the ethical discussion, what they should and should not do. But the short answer to what is ChatGPT and how does it work is it's a generative language model. And um, that means uh, it has seen uh, massive examples of text. And from this, it basically builds up an expectation after seeing a sequence of words, what will be the next word? And uh, then it can add the next word to the text and it builds up an expectation for the next, next word and the next, next word and the next, next word. And in this way, it basically uh, generates an answer or a story or a summary which we conceive as a system that understands the text and behaves like a human and has certain functionality. The reason why it works like that is because our language behavior is in a way predictive. All of us are large language models as well. And if you give us half a sentence, we can kind of complete it with uh, what is probably going to follow. But you can also do this with uh, not with uh, what this next is words, but it could be code or an image or sound or e even an action. As long as you have sufficient data where an input sequence is followed by something and it can build up a predictive expectation. So that is the short answer. Now let's look at, at what these models actually do if you try them out. So one of the function, of course, whether it's the primary function that they are trained with is give the most likely next word after a prompt or a sequence that you give. So I, here I typed in, uh, in chat GPT, Bach sat down the organ and played, and now just complete this. And then it comes up with this list, like a magni magnificent uh, fugue, a breathtaking prelude, all kinds of typical Bach compositions, cantata, an aria, an organ piece. It also comes up with this kind of a statement to the right, which also makes you believe that it actually knows about Johann Sebastian Bach, that he's a renowned composer and an organist, and that this list is based on the, the, the kind of music that he was famous for creating and performing. This is a model that has absorbed this knowledge by reading the, the, all these texts and can now produce it and also answer questions. Okay, now let's move on. Let's slightly change this to somebody else. And we ask the same question, but now it's Beethoven sitting down the organ. And we get a very different list because after Beethoven and the rest of the sentence is exactly the same, but there's another expectation. And it's slightly different. There is a soul stirring melody and there's a powerful organ symphony and majestic improvisation. Some of them similar, some of them very different from the, from the Bach list. But it comes also with a kind of a warning here that, uh, hey, Bach is not really known as an organist. He's a composer and a pianist. But if you want to really imagine uh, that Bach, Beethoven would do this, then this is the, mo the, the most likely list. Okay, let's see what happens if you stretch the model a little bit more. So we move to Mick Jagger. We get now, of course, a blues riff, a rock groove, catchy melody. So everything is the same, except I changed the, the name of uh, Bach to Beethoven and now to Mick Jagger. And again, there is a, a kind of a flag here, a warning Mick Jagger. 
lead singer of the Rolling Stones, is not known for playing the organ, actually he plays the mouse organ pr- pretty pretty well. But uh, that kind of nuance is, uh, is missed by ChatGPT. So it's kind of interesting that it comes up also with, I really think it's fascinating that it comes with these uh, side notes that it didn't ask for as warnings or critical notes uh, with respect to the possible answers that it has to give uh, to your question. Okay, I can also now start playing. So let's create somebody like a, a Johan Jagger or something like that. And it's getting a little bit more careful. Some possibilities include, and it starts to also become creative. Because what I'm doing is I'm, I'm tickling this model with kind of input uh, that it hasn't really seen before. And it needs to make, make sense of it. And it starts to also know, it doesn't know who John Jagger is. So it cannot really tell you anything about the background of John Jagger. But it says that this continuation depends on the tone, atmosphere, storyline of the narrative, which is just a very broad and general disclaimer. Okay, we can do this in many different ways. I can also ask for Ludwig Jagger, a non-existing one, and it got a little bit more different ones because it's combining Ludwig Beethoven personality with Mick Jagger personalities, and we get a different mixture. I can do it with myself. I don't even play organ. It does know something about me that has picked up some data information. I'm a computer scientist and a professor. I'm not associated with playing an organ, and it comes up with very funny things like computer-generated symphony and a linguistic melody like that one. Uh, multilingual composition is also very creative and interesting. But you can see that you can massage the model to do whatever you want it to do. So what is going on here is what I call a distributional bias. Yeah, so all the data that is out there is showing a kind of a distribution where there are certain things very frequent, uh, which is the head of the distribution, <coughs> which are famous people like Bach and Beethoven and Mick Jagger. And then there is a lot of data, long tailish, occurring maybe only once about people who are not famous or not occurring at all. And typically these models, when they come across something that doesn't occur at all, they break it down into known pieces. So whatever this person Ludwig Jagger is, it will be broken down to things associated with Ludwig What is the most famous Ludwig? Well, that is uh, Ludwig from Beethoven. And the most famous Jagger, that is Mick Jagger. And then creates a new personality. So these long tail entities get information which actually belongs to the head distributions. So that's not very truthful or faithful. And if you would ask for properties about this long tail entity, Ludwig Jagger, you will get an answer which is derived from the properties from uh, the data that is observed for the frequent, the hat distribution. And the other way around, if you ask a question, who composed something and you just make up some kind of a story, the most likely answer is that it will come back with a hat entity and not with a long tail entity. So you can do this in ChatGPT. So if you ask this, then we get as an answer, in transcendent symphony that blended classical grandeur with modern innovation, captivating audiences around the world. This is according to ChatGPT, where Ludwig Jagger composed. This made a person. But if you turn it around, you take this answer and ask, turn it into a question and ask who did this, who composed this, it's coming back, of course, with either Mick Jagger or Ludwig von Beethoven. In this case, Ludwig von Beethoven, one is more popular than Jagger. And it fills in this as an answer. Okay, so I see these uh, generative models as blenders. So in the pre-training phase, when they process a lot of facts, but also claims from people and opinions that they make, there are statements like uh, Mick sings the blues, Bastian plays organ, Ludwig composes romantic music, and it kind of uh, breaks it down into different uh, words like Mick and Sebastian and Ludwig, and play, sing, compose, and make, creates associations across these different words. And if you, during inferencing, prompt it with other words, like Ludwig plays romantic blues on, these prompts will trigger, or I say, tickle the model to come back with the associations. And it just fills in the most probable or likely one. Now, of course, it will be able to predict anything that is somehow strongly associated, including opinions and claims that we may not agree with or that we won't like. 
So what they do is like this blender is just producing some kind of uncontrolled soup. They filter the output. That's the ugly picture here at the end in order for the model to behave appropriately. So this is how the uh, hallucinations occur. The hallucinations, they come from these uh, blended associations. So anything can be created by the model uh, by prompting it in a certain way. So if you want to produce something like an organ, maybe you do this. If you want to produce a piano, you just tickle it a little bit differently and then you get a piano, even though it's still Ludwig. So the information is produced. It didn't look up the fact that it has seen during pre-training. It is just producing it because it can't help producing it uh, on the basis of the associations. So in a search engine, the query looks at the index and the index points you back to the actual effect. In this case, that left part is gone. It's no longer there. So it, basically, if it gives a correct answer, it's also hallucinating. Only you don't want to notice it. And uh, if it, you ask it for very rare things, it's very likely to hallucinate it because the association is weak and it can come up with any kind of association.